Hi, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Taking Control of Your Diabetes podcast. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Jeremy Pettis. I am not joined today by my typical uh, co-host, Dr. Steve Edelman, who is actually undergoing knee surgery tomorrow. Um, so in honor of Steve and you know, wishing the best for him, we're talking about hospital management of diabetes. And we are very fortunate to be joined on a expert in this topic, uh, Dr. Tricia Santos, who works on the inpatient in the hospital diabetes management service at, at UCSD um, and helps basically run the management of all patients in the hospital with diabetes. So thanks for joining us, Trish. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about this today. And Trish has been a good friend for years of Steve and I. We've known, uh, I don't know, Trish, at least a decade or more, probably like 15 years for me. Um, so, Trish, you have a very interesting job. And it's one that honestly didn't exist that long ago, where it used to be kind of when people came in the hospital, um, they'd be kind of lucky if anybody was looking at their diabetes. Sometimes it would be surgeons. Sometimes it would be you know medicine doctors. You now kind of run a specialty service of, of doctors, nurses, um, nurse practitioners that manage diabetes. So tell us about what that looks like, what that team is, um, and then eventually we're going to kind of walk through the a day in the life of what happens to you know patients when they get admitted to the hospital. Yeah, sure. So uh, you know, hospitals nowadays are caring a lot more about diabetes management in the hospital, and I think that's come from new data that we have. Well, it's not that new, but data that we have now showing that it matters what your blood sugars are in the hospital. It's not just, you know, oh, we can deal with those when you're an outpatient. There's data showing that patients do better when their blood sugars are controlled in the hospital, their infections get better, they, you know, get out of the hospital quicker, et cetera. Um, so it's become an important issue. At UCSD, we have a whole team of doctors and nurses and uh, diabetes educators who manage the patients in the hospital. I would say not every hospital has that. I think many hospitals are moving towards that, though. So it, it may be your experience may be varied depending on what hospital you're at. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's important you say that because you would hope that hospitals would do this because it's the right thing to do to manage people's blood sugars. You do a good job of it. Um, but it ends up coming to dollars and cents for the hospitals. And with this data showing that people do better get out of the hospital sooner when you control their blood sugars, that's a, you know, a value proposition for them. And it's it really created this this impetus on on creating these services. And we all have these horror stories of what it kind of, quote unquote, used to be like. Um I remember when I was a resident in medical training, um, I was looking on the computer for this patient who had diabetes, and normally they record their blood sugars like during the day, and there was no numbers in the chart. And so I went to see the patient, and the patient had type 1, and I said, well, where's all the blood sugars? And the nurse said, well, they're on you know, one of those insulin pump things that kind of does everything, so we haven't been checking the blood sugars because it kind of does it all itself. And of course, when they actually checked the blood sugars, it was extremely high. They just had been basically not paying attention because uh, unfortunately, a lot of healthcare providers don't understand diabetes that well. It's so true. And, and believe it or not, there's a lot of confusion about what a pump does and what a CGM does. Mm -hmm. So just the other day I was in the hospital and they asked us to remove a patient's insulin pump because there was blood all over it. And I went down and looked at the patient's abdomen and it was their Dexcom CGM that had blood all over it. Yeah. You know, it wasn't the insulin, they didn't even have a pump. So there's a lot of confusion. And I think that's why places like TCOID are so important because it, it teaches the patients to kind of advocate for themselves. Not everybody in the hospital understands diabetes because the technology is moving so quickly. Yeah. So when you go to the hospital, I kind of think of it as like a TSA line at the, the airport where every time I go through that, they're like, what's this? Mm -hmm. My pump, CGM, like all that kind of educating them. So, um, so then what we're going to be talking about is, you know, people with diabetes, uh, we all get sick. Um, we have to go to the hospital for some reason. It could be surgery, pneumonia, whatever. So when a person comes into the hospital, they have diabetes type 1 or type 2, how do you get involved? How do you know about the patient? And then how do you kind of assess them initially? Okay. So usually um, if a patient, we are a consultant team. So that means that we don't see every patient in the hospital who has diabetes. So either, usually it's the primary team that's taking care of the patient, either the internal medicine team or the surgery team that has asked us to get involved. And sometimes they ask us to get involved right when the patient comes into the emergency room. Often that's the case with type 1. Um, for patients with type 2, sometimes they don't let us get, or they don't ask us to get involved until the blood sugars are kind of out of control. 
And so would you advise patients listening to this that they should, when they go to the hospital, they should ask immediately is if there's a consult service or a diabetes specialty service? I would say it depends. Um, for, if you have type 1 diabetes, I would definitely ask for an endocrinologist, endocrinologist or a kind of specialty service to come in and, and be a part of your team. If you have type 2 diabetes, it kind of depends. You know, if you are on one or two medications and your, you know, blood sugars are usually in range, it that you may not need a specialty team to take care of you. It kind of depends on the circumstances. Got it. So then maybe let's break it down type one, type two. So you, you go to see a type two patient. How do you determine what they're going to need in the hospital? Yeah, that's a really good question. So many people think that when they come into the hospital, they should be kind of taking the same doses of medicine that they're taking outside the hospital. And it's pretty far from the truth when it comes down to it. So there's a few things. Number one, we don't continue kind of generally pills that you're on for diabetes or once a week injections like GLP-1s when patients are in the hospital. And there's a lot of different reasons for this, but some of them are that, you know, some of these medicines can make you feel sick if you're not eating or drop your blood sugar too low if you're not eating. And in the hospital, you may be told you can't eat kind of on a whim, you know, when they can't predict it. In the hospital, your kidney function can change very quickly. And so that can affect kind of how these medicines affect you. Um, there's other things like certain procedures and stress that can affect your blood sugar. So it overall just becomes kind of dangerous to mm -hmm. be on pills and, and these once a week medicines. Um, so usually we stop all of those. And then when we're determining an insulin dose for a patient, most of the time, believe it or not, we do it based on um, some numbers. We look at their weight, we look at their kidney function, and we look at kind of their A1C or their overall glucose control. And that's how we determine it. Um, you may be shocked that the insulin doses, if you're on insulin with type 2 as an outpatient, are usually drastically different than what patients are taking in the hospital. So, and I think that's important for patients to hear that, you know, I take metformin and one or two pills at the, you know, a day, and all of a sudden I'm in the hospital and they're, they're pricking my finger and giving me insulin. You know, it doesn't mean that their diabetes is worse or that the hospital is doing something kind of aggressive. It's just, correct me if I'm wrong, a little bit easier to kind of change it rapidly versus having these pills that can last a long time, et cetera. That's exactly right. Yeah. And and I usually tell, tell patients when I see them in the hospital, we're going to stop all of your you know home medications and we only use insulin in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So they, they, you know, don't get scared, like you said. Um, on a rare occasion, we will start some of these medications kind of later on in the hospitalization when things stabilize, some of the outpatient medications. But the general rule is insulin's what's used in the hospital. Got it. And then what do you find about an opportunity for, again, stick with type twos for now, about education in the hospital? I mean, um, we were talking a little bit about this as a chance to get some kind of um, real dedicated diabetes education. We have their attention, whatever, um, chances to change medications, to kind yeah. of tune people up with their diabetes regimen. Yeah, I would say if you're a type two going into the hospital, one of the best things you can do to kind of get something out of it for your diabetes is to be honest with whatever doctors and nurses you're talking about with how things are going on the outpatient side. So that comes in many forms. So for example, if you're taking, you know, 80 units of insulin, of basal insulin every day and 30 units of insulin with all your meals, if that's your prescribed dose in your chart, but you're never actually taking that, it's important to mention that when you go into the hospital. Um, many times patients aren't taking what they're prescribed. I mean, it's very, very common. It's hard to take these medications. Sometimes, you know, they're scared to take them, whatever the reason may be. But if those medications are listed in your chart, there's a really good chance that somebody is going to prescribe that dose to you when you get into the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this happen time and time again when we get consulted because somebody's on, you know, 50 units of Lantus and they give it to them in the hospital and then their blood sugar drops down to 20 yeah. because they never take 50 units of Lantus or their blood sugar drops down to 20 because they take 50 units of Lantus, but they're usually drinking, you know, two liters of Coke all day long right. and they don't have that in the hospital, you know, so things being honest about kind of what you're eating at home are you actually taking your medication at home that's prescribed is really important for your safety in the hospital and then allows us to have kind of a starting point to maybe talk about how to make things better for when you leave. Yeah. And then talk real quick about what your goals are for blood sugars when people are in the hospital. 
And this is for everybody with diabetes. Correct. So the general goal, you know, there's there's sometimes a little more specific goals depending on whether you're in the ICU, et cetera. But in general, the goals for patients are in, in the hospital are uh, glucose between 100 and 180. Um, so those are what we feel are kind of safe ranges. So you may see someone saying, gosh, your blood sugar was a little on the low side and you know, you say, my blood sugar was 85, that's fine, mm-hmm. you know, but in the hospital, that's a little too close for comfort for us because, again, it, you know, you could not be eating for several days. There can be lots of other factors. Yeah. Okay. And then for type 1s, how is your thought process immediately different when you see some type 1 in their chart when you kind of approach them or things that you are immediately concerned about when you see them? Or Yeah. So for type ones, um, a lot of the same things. So number one, really important that you're honest with, you know, whatever doctors and nurses are seeing you that you tell them kind of what you're doing at home. Are you actually giving yourself insulin every time you eat? You know, do you skip doses of your insulin? Those kinds of things are important because if you don't have a specialty team managing you, there's a risk that they're going to use your outpatient dosing. And again, that can be dangerous if your diet has changed or if you're, you know, you have a lot more stress or whatever the the scenario is. Um, So that's a big one. Type ones, I would say the first, my, my biggest concern right off the bat is to make sure that they have basal insulin in their system. So, you know, if I don't see it ordered, I want to make sure that's ordered really quickly. If they might be on a pump, you know, I always run downstairs and make sure their pump is still, you know, connected and running. Um, so that's kind of my biggest concern right off the bat when I see type ones. So then tell us about the technology, CGMs, pumps, how people can use in the hospital, how they can't. All yeah. That. So um, insulin pumps and CGMs in most hospitals, I would say nowadays, um, you can keep them on when you're in the hospital. Um, while you can keep them on, the CGMs are not FDA approved in the hospital yet. I think it's coming mm-hmm. soon. Um, but what that means is even if you're wearing a pump and your pump is talking to your CGM and adjusting your insulin for you, the nurses will still have to come in and poke your finger four times a day, which seems kind of ridiculous. But, yeah. you know, no, they're not trying to bug you, but they're just doing their job and kind of, you know, checking boxes that they have to do in order to, um, you know, keep you safe in the hospital. But most of the time you should be able to keep on your pump and your CGM. Um You know, in terms of managing a pump in the hospital, you have to, you want to be kind of cognizant of how well you're doing. Like if you're feeling super crummy and you're tired or out of it, you want to let someone know that maybe the pump's not a good idea because you can't actually, you know, interact with it and manage it. And and you may need to go on injections for a short period of time. Got it. Yeah. So when you see a type one and they're on a pump and they're managing it themselves, but their blood sugars are kind of still all over the place. Do you usually take them off the pump then and do injections or can you still help them just select the bolus through the pump? So I think it probably depends on what hospital you're at. At our hospital, we're, you know, very accustomed to pump use and managing pumps. So we actually try and help them with their settings while they're in the hospital Mm -hmm. um, and help try and find what the best settings are. You know, we we ask them what they ate. We look at how much they bolus for that. um, And we try and help them with their adjustments. Sometimes we do have to adjust the settings in the hospital simply because they're laying around a lot more or their diet has changed. So sometimes we have to adjust it just for, for that reason. Yeah. Um, the one thing about wearing a pump or CGM in the hospital is you, you do have to have your supplies with you. So hospitals are not stocked with infusion sites or extra sensors or those things. So if you're on the way to the hospital and you're feeling good enough to remember, you want to make sure and grab your supplies or, or you can always have someone bring them to you. So talk to me a little bit about diets in the hospital. What I mean, not necessarily diets, but the food. So usually, you know, I haven't done this in a while, but you can order different diets. There's kind of the standard diet. There's, um, you know, the low-carb or diabetic diet. Um, Do those things have meanings, like in terms of absolute carb counts that standardize across hospitals, or is it kind of different no matter where you go? So it's different where no matter where you go. Um, But I would say most hospitals, to be on a, a... diet for diabetes or some of them call them carb limited diets or carb consistent diets. There's different names for them. Essentially what it's saying is it's giving you kind of a a carb allotment for each meal. And in general, that's usually 60 grams of carbs, Mm -hmm. which for most people is plenty of carbs Mm -hmm. for a meal. Um, 
So if, if that's the case, then when you order, you know, your meal, you can order up to 60 grams of carbohydrates and then you can order kind of as much as you want of anything else. So if you want to get chicken or tuna salad or whatever else you want, you can order, order okay. that. Um, so it's up to, cause I'm thinking that sounds high. It's so, right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's up to, um, you know, we also have patients who are underweight, for example, maybe they have cancer, maybe they have cystic fibrosis, maybe they have, um, another disease where they're really trying to put on weight and we can also up their carb allotment. So sometimes we have people on a quote unquote, you know, carb limited diet, but we can put them up to 90 grams of carbs or even 120 grams of carbs per meal. So mm -hmm. I would say if you're, if you don't feel like you're getting enough food, you're welcome to kind of talk to your team about that. The main thing we, the main reason that we want people to be on a special diet is we don't like um, carb drinks in the hospital. Yeah. They're just really, really hard to manage. So, uh, you know, personally, you mean like Lucerna's. Or no, I mean like, um, like Luc soda, like Pepsi oh, or yeah. lemonade or ginger ale, you know, that some people want to sip on ginger ale all day because their stomach's upset. Yeah, yeah. And that really makes it hard for us to control the blood sugars yeah. where if we can just give you a diet ginger ale, then that's fine. Yeah. I remember that was one of your guys' always kind of key questions, like how much juice soda, mm -hmm. kind of the two no's. You know, I'm a big believer in that people with diabetes should be able to eat what they want to, you know, up to a certain point. But juice and soda are things that just they're just gotta tough. Go. Yeah. yeah, they're just tough. And and when people are sipping on them all day in the hospital, we're usually not able to kind of microdose you with insulin all day for that. Yeah. So it just becomes hard to to keep the blood sugars controlled. And I was we were talking before this that, you know, it is kind of a, a rare occurrence then that you can standardize the meals, you know, three times a day, you can standardize the insulin dosing. So it can be a time for patients really to kind of learn carb counting and carb doses for insulin. I was telling you, I had this patient that was in the hospital type one for weeks for an infection. And um, before he went to the hospital, his A1C was like 13 or higher, you know, meaning his blood sugars were two, 300 all the time and came out of the hospital with like an A1C seven or lower. I mean, he had a dramatic improvement and, and kept it there because he finally was able to really gain confidence in that taking this amount of insulin before eating was appropriate. He wasn't going to go low or too high. And so it can be a chance to kind of lock in some of these core concepts when you're doing all these kind of in a more regimented way. For sure. And and think of it as a time while you're sitting there day after day trying to get better. It's a it's a time where you literally have 24 hour access to nurses who most of them know quite a bit about diabetes or at least during the daytime. You know, we'll we'll spend time teaching patients reviewing kind of techniques for insulin injections. Um you know, showing patients how to check their blood sugar. Oftentimes we'll place a sample continuous glucose monitor on someone in the hospital so mm -hmm. we can show them how to use it, show them how to get started. We can sit there with them and download apps. And, you know, it's a really unique time that you don't get when you're just visiting your doctor. Yeah. And and on that note of CGM in the hospital, I forgot to mention um, – a lot of patients that are wearing CGM in the hospital, either, you know, type ones that come in on them already or or patients that we put a sample on, they really freak out when their blood sugar doesn't match the hospital meter mm -hmm. blood sugar. Um, and and it's really important to remember that the hospital meter, you know, is not the gold standard. That is not, you know, the, end the, the actual end. truth yeah. of what your blood sugar is. The actual truth is if we, you know, drew your blood from your vein and checked your, your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to remember that we expect a little bit of discrepancy between the two of those and, and they're not going to match perfectly. Right. And the sensor gets better over time. Usually the first day or two is a little off yes. and it, it kind of improves. And along those, like that idea of access to care and, and things, you know, I remember not that long ago, there was a patient that was newly diagnosed in type one, newly diagnosed type one in the hospital. And before she left, she got on a, a Dexcom and, you know, was still doing, you know, injections. But how cool is that when someone's like first diagnosed, getting like access to this technology, getting to put it on, getting trained. And I remember thinking, this is somebody who really will never check their blood sugars, you know, like ever. Um, and what a difference that is from just a handful of years ago. Um, I don't know, just maybe think of that, how technology is yeah. improving. Yeah. And, and that happens for type twos, <clears throat> newly diagnosed in the hospital. Oftentimes we'll try and put a CGM on them just so that they can really get a sense of like what different foods do to their blood sugars, mm. or even if they're not wearing it kind of long term. Yeah. Um, just to have even a few weeks of looking at that data is super helpful. Now, a couple quick closing moments. I think we should talk briefly about kind of planned surgeries, planned procedures. 
So a lot of this we were just talking about was if you get sick and are in the hospital, what happens to your blood sugars? But the flip side is, well, what happens if I've got a surgery in six weeks like, you know, Steve, or I have a colonoscopy? This tends to be more of an issue for type 1s or certainly people on insulin. Um, but just let's start maybe with type 1s on this. Um, what do you tell them planning for surgery procedures? Yeah, and and this is a common thing, right? Mm -hmm. People are having procedures all the time. Um, so in general, people, the main thing that we like to think about is avoiding hypoglycemia mm. because in the short term, that is much more dangerous than having hyperglycemia for, you know, 24 to 48 hours. Um, so in general, we tell people to reduce their doses of insulin. Um, they should really, you know, for the night before the procedure, the day before the procedure, they would take usually about 80% of their usual dose. Now, some people, this varies a little bit depending on, you know, how kind of tuned in their basal doses in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of our general rule of thumb is we want you to reduce your your insulin. You know, you're not eating. You're not going to be eating for a long time probably. Um, the other thing for type 1s that's, that's important to consider is asking for a morning procedure if you mm -hmm. can yeah. um, because you don't want to be kind of waiting all day not eating, you know, from the night before and then the whole next day not eating. It makes so, it it's just a lot easier to ask for a morning procedure. Supposedly they prioritize people with diabetes for morning procedures. Procedures, do you find that to be the case or not? I don't know. Yeah. I think it's it's dependent on the, the surgeon and the department and the procedure. Um, and then type ones who are on a pump, you would, it depends on kind of which type of pump you're on. If you're on these automated insulin delivery systems, if you're on tandem control IQ, you can put yourself into activity mode, which aims for a little bit higher blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Again, the goal is to reduce hypoglycemia or risk of hypoglycemia. If you're on Omnipod 5, you can raise your target up to 150. So mm -hmm. it's targeting a higher blood sugar for you. Um, so those are things that you can do. Yeah. And what about people get scared? Oh my gosh, like I can't eat anything after dinner, or after midnight. And what if I go low? What if my blood sugar goes low? If I eat or drink something, are they going to cancel my procedure? What do you tell folks for that? Yeah. So you know, they can't do a procedure if you're totally out of it and on the floor. So you have to treat lows. Um, so you're allowed to treat lows even when you're told you're not allowed to eat. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes glucose tabs are great um, because they're not kind of a big bulky thing that sits in your stomach all day. You know, they're absorbed very quickly. Um, so we tell people get glucose tabs. You can also drink um, clear, small amounts of clear liquid like uh, Sprite or ginger ale or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's so important because like we were saying, like, you know, you do this flawlessly most days, like you don't go low, but it's going to be the one time before a surgery sure. that you go low at night and you want to know that, yeah, treat your low and you can go in and you don't have to even hide that from the anesthesiologist. No. Yeah. I had like a little bit of, you know, apple juice or whatever at 2 a.m. Um, and again, they're just trying to avoid kind of a big bulky meal that you're going to potentially vomit or something like that. So, right. Um, and yeah. then type twos is different. Mm -hmm. So for type twos, Usually they're on a mix of pills and some people are on once a week injections. Some people are on, um, you know, daily injections of insulin or more. Um, so type twos, it really depends on which medicines you're taking. So in general, the day of your procedure, you're going to avoid taking pills like metformin and um, maybe Genuvia, Farsiga, you know, Jardians, those sorts of things. Um, and then same thing with the insulin. If you're on insulin in your type 2, we would still reduce your insulin to about 80% of your usual dose. One thing to keep in mind for type 2s and actually some type 1s that are on SGLT2 inhibitors, so that class of medication, Farsiga, Jardians, Invokana, those medicines have to be stopped three days before a procedure. So that's a little bit different and something that you have to think about you know, way far out mm -hmm. before that procedure. Um, so those medications can actually be, be, be kind of dangerous if you're taking them and not eating at all right. for, for a period of time. And they need three days to get out of your system. Um, so those have to be stopped kind of far ahead. And that's good to know because my sense is that things like aspirin and maybe like pain medicines – like are in all these protocols and patients are sent home with what to do. But usually the diabetes meds are sometimes forgotten about. Yeah. So is that just something that people need to ask specifically about each medication? Or Yeah, how? really they have to ask about each. We When we give instructions in the diabetes clinic, we give them instructions as to what to do starting three days before their procedure if they're on one of these SGLT2s every single day up to the day of their procedure. Mm -hmm. And we list out every med separately because they're all a little bit different. If you're on a once a week injection, you can usually take that. 
during your procedure. You actually don't have to stop it. If you're on some of these other pills, you only have to stop it the day of your procedure. So mm -hmm. it can be really confusing. And on that note, um, a lot of people when they're having these procedures, colonoscopies, those kind of frequent procedures, oftentimes those clinics will treat type ones and type twos the same. Right. And they'll tell sometimes type ones to stop their insulin altogether. Just hold your insulin on the day of the yep. procedure. Don't take your insulin or take your insulin. I had a patient just the other day um, who was told to take their insulin pump off um, four hours before a PET scan. And which is an imaging procedure. Yeah. So these sorts of things can be really dangerous. We have had many cases where type ones have gone into DKA because they're just following what, you know, the doctor or nurse is telling them to do. Yeah. And, you know, that's an important, unfortunate assumption that people cannot make that yeah. um, healthcare providers might not know what they're talking about when it comes to diabetes. And that's really the whole point of doing this podcast is... That if you're listening, you you probably know a lot about diabetes and certainly about your own body. So if you're getting some kind of advice or something that's happening that doesn't feel quite right or you know is different than what you've been told, advocate for yourself. Um, speak up. That's never viewed as as a bad thing. And we like it when patients are engaged and kind of asking things. Um, and if you're armed with a little bit of kind of knowledge about how to prepare for the hospitalization, it'll go well. For sure. And I, I always love it as a diabetes provider when my patients tell me about upcoming surgeries and yeah. procedures because I like to be involved. And so tell your primary care doctor, tell your endocrinologist when you have a procedure so they can weigh in too, mm -hmm. you know, because maybe their recommendations differ and, and will keep you safer. But I think, you know, this topic is is not super fun yeah. <laughs> to talk about, but I think that um, it's kind of the classic TCOYD topic, which is like taking control of your own situation yeah. and, and really advocating for yourself. It's so important. Absolutely. And, you know, we're wishing Steve luck. This is all happening tomorrow. I'm sure yeah. he'll do fine. Um, thanks for the inspiration, Steve. Yeah. So, um, but I think that'll wrap it up. So thanks Trish for being here and doing this. Um, we just also filmed a, a video version of this that we're going to put in the, the video vault, um, the time of that TBD, but you were talking about, it's such a good thing, a resource for patients to, to have, to be able to go on our website, tcoid.org, click on the video, find this, um, in the event that they know they have a surgery or something they can come back to kind of refer to as a, as a reference and this podcast. So hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, always fun doing it with you, Trish. And um, we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks. Bye-bye.